Well, good afternoon and evening, everyone. And I am hoping you all can hear me. Uh, if you cannot hear me, please send a chat message to Alex Warren. Um, but I will proceed, assuming that you can. Uh, my name is Peter Berman. I'm the director of the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. And I want to welcome you to the fourth Voices in Health seminar of this calendar year, which is sponsored uh, on our behalf by the Center for Applied Ethics at UBC. And thank you for joining us. This is a new experience for us in Voices in Health, a little bit different, but many things are different these days. Uh, and it's wonderful to see so many people signed on uh, for this important event. Um, let me begin uh, by acknowledging that our event takes place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded, unceded indigenous territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations, as well as any other lands that you may be tuning in from. And our speaker today tuning in from the Sturgeon Lake First Nation. Um, and as always, we appreciate the opportunity that we have to gather on these beautiful lands and consider it a privilege to be here. This is even a unique opportunity to gather on some very non-traditional territory, in quotes, uh, that is the virtual territory of the internet. And that belongs to all of us. And, uh, and it's a wonderful thing to at least be able to take advantage of that on this occasion. We'll talk about some key issues today, always relevant, but particularly relevant as we face the current crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic together. Um, we have so much opportunity to talk about things we often discuss in population and public health, the epi epidemiology, the progress of disease, public health measures to slow down or uh, avoid the spread of disease and so on. But today we're going to focus on something very important and somewhat different, and that is the spiritual health that all of us must guard in, in, a, in, a, in an epidemic like this. Let me pass the mic over now to Professor Michael Burgess um, uh, from UBC Okanagan, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Mike, please go ahead. Thanks, Peter, for chairing this event, um, and thank all of you for joining through the webinar. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm on, working on the territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation. We're partners uh, in the formation and the management of the uh, Okanagan campus, and, and it's a great pleasure to work with them. Um, but I also have another great pleasure to introduce Willie Ehrman today. Uh, but after he speaks, we'll have an audience Q&A where you can submit your questions. What you need to do is put them in the chat, address to me, and then I will uh, um, go through the questions and we'll have the discussion. So um, Professor Ehrman is a traditional health coordinator in the Sturgeon Lake, Sturgeon Lake, where he lives with his family. Um, he's a retired professor emeritus with the First Nations University of Canada. Um, and Sturgeon Lake, just for, for all of your reference, is in the north central part of Saskatchewan. Uh, he has lectured in the areas of education, humanities, indigenous studies, and research methods, and published numerous academic articles and reports to the Tri-Council Panel on Research Ethics. He's presented nationally and internationally um, in meetings and knowledge symposiums on the topics of education, research, and in particular, the nature of indigenous thought. Professor Ehrman has worked extensively with elders in his research. He promotes ethical practice of research involving indigenous peoples with a particular interest in the conceptual development of the ethical space, a theoretical space between culture and worldviews. Um, he's also was deeply involved, key in, in a video that the Sturgeon Lake First Nation developed about the effects of the 1918 pandemic, commonly known as the Spanish flu. Um, and it's up on Voices in Health website or on YouTube. I really recommend you watch that. It's, a, it's an interesting take on the historically how the, the, the community went through the pandemic then with lessons for our, our current situation. Um, even though it was published a decade ago, the effects are still felt in the, in the first uh, Sturgeon Lake First Nation and the community's recommendation is still. Now, I'll just hand this off now to Willie for his talk at Spiritual Health in Times of Crisis, Integrating Traditional Medicine and the Scientific Method in the Indigenous Communities. Willie? Thank you, Michael. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Peter, and and thank you, Alex, as well, and and Simona. I'd like to thank, first of all, thank UBC for inviting me um, to Vancouver at one point, <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm still there in spirit. I'd like to thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to talk about this very important matter. Matters, I would say. Um, so I'd like to thank each of you uh, for your invitation. And I hope um, we, I also want to acknowledge all your listeners, all your participants out there, wherever you may be. I want to ask everyone to think along with me, to think uh, as I go through this talk. And this talk is called a Spiritual Health in Times of Crisis, Integrating Traditional Medicine with the Scientific Method in Indigenous Communities. Now, that's a pretty loaded topic, a pretty loaded headline, because and which of those I will be talking more on, I'm not sure, because here, have a look at this title, Spiritual Health. I can talk an hour, two hours about that alone. Times of crisis, well, it could be mental, it could be family, it could be community, it could be national. Again, we can talk so much about times of crisis, but I think we can kind of focus, keep our mind on what we're experiencing right now. Traditional medicine, I can talk again all day on that, but we don't have all day. The scientific method, I'm not a scientist, but I think I can talk a little bit quite lengthy about that too, maybe, maybe criticism in some cases. Indigenous communities, there you go again, another heavy topic. What can we, what can we select to talk about our indigenous communities? There's so much to talk about. So I come from a, a traditional perspective. I come from a community of people, a human community of people. Imagine that, a human community. We are Cree. Nihiawak, we are Cree in this community. Um, you have other communities as well. Those are human communities. And we were all placed here by something much more powerful than, say, the constitution of this nation. We were here for thousands and thousands of years. And here we are today, 2020, April 16th, having a chat. Okay, so that's the title. And as we move on, I want to show you a picture that reminds me a lot about where we come from. I'm not nostalgic to show this picture of my great my great grandfather, my great grandmother, my grandmother, and my grandfather. I show it because I want to appreciate the kind of minds that they had, the understandings that they had, especially when we talk about, say, spirituality or traditional thought or indigenous thought. You know, none of these people that you see in your screen went to school, Western schooling. And yet they were, you know, in their own way, the smartest people in the community because of what they knew. My great grandfather holding the cap there is a, a, a healer who remembered a time before he was born. Can you imagine that? He remembered a time before he was born. He knew what happened before he was born to this earth. These are narratives, family narratives. I mean, my grandfather, my, my grandmothers, I both of them I saw, my great grandmother, my grandmother. I didn't see my grandfather, but you know, in my dreams I have met my grandfather. But these are influential in my thought in terms of what, what I think about where we are now, where we come from, and where we are headed. I wish I could go in 
to their mind and really scour what, what it is, what kind of understandings they knew about life, about humanity, about loving, about having children and grandchildren, you know, the things that really, really matter to us. I want to show you another picture. And it is this. This is a, a picture of one of our medicine ladies, a matriarch. A matriarch is the head of the family. We come from a matriarchal system, the Cree people in our community. We come from a matriarchal system. It was the great grandmother who was in charge of the family. She was the guide. She was the one that would guide all the family into the future. She was the one that created the nation. The matriarchs in the family are take their responsibility very, very seriously. As any mother would understand that they want the best for their family. They want the best health for their family. If one, one of their children or grandchildren falls sick, they want to be able to have them healthy. They want to do things. They want to use a kind of medicine that's really, really going to work. And so matriarchs, they were responsible not only for their, their children, but also their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. And they had to look at beyond the health of the people. They had to, they had to see, they had to, you know, maneuver the spiritual world that it would help the children and grandchildren. They had to understand the plants. They had to know the land. They had to know so much psychology and physiology and all those things that that we were responsible for. So this picture that you see is a medicine woman uh, that went around house to house to to uh, do medicinal work. And, and such great knowledge, and I wish I can go into the mind of this old lady. So this is what we are interested in when we talk about traditional Cree health, to understand what did these people know? What, what, what was... What was it that they knew about medicines, about health, about the world, about spirituality? And so in our time, we are now, uh, this is what we're trying to study. And the next picture is us. This is us. <laughs> we are just like children trying to study these ancient ancestral ways of health and knowledge and understanding you know uh we are just children so let me play that again this is the ancient knowledge the real deep rich knowledge that we are interested in and this is us that study that knowledge in our time because so much has happened that has erased a lot of our memory about about our ways about our knowledge our medicinal ways what our, our holistic ways. So this is us that we're just learning. We're just like children trying to recover doing the memory work that is required to bring back the traditional ways of understanding the world and the land and, and everything else that is, with, uh, that is before us. So ground zero, as you know, right now is, you know, in time of crisis, uh, particularly when it gets really heavy, you know, that the ground, so we know ground zero is right in our homes. We're, we're isolated in our homes, this is ground zero. So and we understand that the, the main thing that we're pursuing is health. Oh, we're praying every day not to have any of our loved ones be hit by this sickness, you know. So ground zero is happening right now in your home. The, the, this is the place where what you do is going to be very important in terms of what the outcome is going to be. If we're careless, perhaps we might catch this 
uh, floating sickness, you know. But if we're careful, if we do the right things, we'll come out on the other end smiling. But ground zero, we have to look after this ground zero, our immediate family, our our houses, you know, our spheres where, where we can do things that, that really matter. And within that ground zero is so much potential, the potential. And that's what we want to bring out. So we know that we know that our people were healthy people. We we know that uh, that we come from a healthy community. It's only recently that you know Western doctors have set foot into our community. Very recently. Before that, we had you know we had to rely our, on our own resources. Our own healers, our own spiritualists, our own uh, caretakers—you know, our own muscle muscle men that looked after the physical needs of our our families, our community. We had people who worked the heart of our community. They were the heart and soul of our community. They looked after those matters. We had our spiritualists who had sit up all night and do their ceremonies for all our collective, our people. We had little children who were, who reminded us of what's important. So these, you know, we come from traditions that are very rich in terms of our humanity, how we treat each other, who we are, what our purpose is, and how to live a good life. You know, it doesn't have to be rich. It doesn't have to be rich at all. It, it, it's a good life that we are very much uh, interested in and that's been our tradition to uh, we have a tradition of a good life that we would be hard workers we would look after a family like the my uh, those two ladies in the center one of them is my mother another one is my auntie you know they're they're holding their children they're loving their children so this is what life is all about you know, how do you bring up a a human being in a good way so that they are something like my my uncle standing tall and proud there, you know, that those were the protectors of our community. So we come from a tradition, very rich traditions in, in terms of um, our, our community. Now, let me, I, I want to kind of zoom along here. Let me give you a, uh, how we developed our program in, in, in Sturgeon Lake. You know, it starts off with a statement, an intent, and this is very important to think about, a statement, an intent. The intent is very important, you know, especially if we do a collective intent. Um, our intent was the birth of a healthy community. It was an elder that guided, guided us to this thought, the birth of a healthy community. This is the intention. We are now going to be a healthy community. We are being born, we are being birthed, we're birthing a healthy community. So this is the intent, this is the mind work that happens, the birth of a healthy community. And so uh, with, with that statement, you know, that there were unsure beginnings. Um, well, after you say, well, the birth of a healthy, healthy community, now what? Well, where do you begin? So unsure beginnings, but uh, it'll come community got together and they and they raised funds as most communities out there would know indigenous communities out there would know there are no funds for infrastructure not for healing lodges you wouldn't hear of it you know with the federal government funding a healing lodge like that in the community so the community had to fundraise and they did and they did over a period of time and finally they had enough money and they built that lodge, a beautiful lodge, which we work in today. It's a beautiful lodge. and it, it, uh, Once the, the building was complete, I often joke with the, the staff there, you know, everybody took their lawn chairs, 
and they sat and they sat in the line in front of the healing lodge when it was finished and they sat there and twiddled their thumbs and looked at this beautiful healing lodge waiting for health to happen waiting for health to happen now of course it it, it doesn't work like that it, health is not about infrastructure it's a people project so after they got the initial euphoria of a new building then they started getting to work you know really thinking seriously well okay we're going to be healthy what what we what we need and we only we found out there was only one maybe two medicinal ladies that were you know getting really old in the community but they knew a lot about the medicinal plants so we, you know as she came on and started this idea that they were, she would teach others her knowledge so that you know uh, it would continue in that way but she fell sick and there wasn't very much training happening but lo and behold another training program appeared on uh, almost fell on our laps and it was happening in manitoba so we sent people out there to study uh, a four-year program not a full four years you know, of um, uh, one week every summer to study medicinal plants. So then after that, you know, we got into harvesting and finally we developed a pharmacy, a pharmacy. Now, if you come to Sturgeon Lake and you come to our, the healing lodge, you'll see a pharmacy there with all our traditional plants, all our medicines that we actually use for, um, you know, health purposes. Uh, so we have our traditional healing clinics. We bring in healers to do that. And then, so one thing led to another all the time. Then we had to have ethics and protocol for how we handle these uh, uh, sacred medicines. So we got into research. And then finally, with more research, uh, the elders told us to get into mental health. What is traditional mental health? So now we have a mental health program um, that... that does is not psych is not psychological you know um it, it involves a, a, a big big fall camp and it also involves giftedness training for youth you know it's all it, it's it's it, it's really about taking people back to their roots back to the land and and making them be a part of the land again that, that that's where healthiness starts to happen then we got into midwifery, you know, that this is another aspect. If we're going to bring children into this world, let's do it in a very holistic and sacred manner and really acknowledge the sacredness of, of birthing. And, and let, let's teach our kukums and mushrooms and, and young people, the birthing mothers, how to do these things in a traditional way so that they're not, it's not a harsh entry into the into the world for many of the babies as they would experience in hospitals and all that. And on and on it goes from this statement of a birth of a healthy community, all these things starting to fall into place and then now you continue with different programs, you know. And there's a lot that I didn't mention here, but these are things that we actively try to understand how to do. There's a knowledge behind all of this, and there's a methodology behind all of this, that there is a method to understanding, to knowing this kind of knowledge. And that, that's, and that's what we feel is not being recognized. So traditional health really is based on ancestral knowledge of health and healing. Looks within the person. We're really within the person. When we talk about inwardness, you know, the, your your spiritual self, your your values, your emotions. These are unseen things inside of people, uh, inside persons, and they're very influential in terms of what we do, how families. Uh, are, are, are molded, developed, how they work, how the, and then really how the community, how do we operate as a community, as a collective? So these are study areas. Traditional health and healing is based on holistic approaches, which pay attention to the mind, body, emotions, and spirit. And it, and it is about elder memory 
a lot of it has to come there. We have to go back and bring out the memory because so much of our knowledge has been erased through colonialism, through residential schools, through schooling, through you name it. We, we've experienced these uh, acts of um, hostility, racism, whatever you, whatever they are. You know, they, they, we've they've tried to erase us into into non-memory, you know, that we would not no longer exist. But lo and behold, here we are, and our knowledge is there, and we feel so rich, rich, that we can actually delve into our own knowledge and what we see are treasures, real treasures. So back to the land, the old people said, go back to the land, a site for health and healing. We have to be there to know how we do that, how we do health and healing on the land, you know? to understand the physical and spiritual worlds, to understand it, that hill, the meaning of that hill, or the lake, or that, that muskeg, or that uh, landform, the sand hill, perhaps, and how the spiritual wor world, you know, how, how, how this land is a living land that it's, it talks, it, 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 it interacts, it engages, it teaches, it, it, it shares, and everything. That kind of knowledge comes from our traditions. There aren't any books out there that you can read that'll teach you about all that. It takes community memory, it takes the elder, uh, memory of elders to bring that out. So what we're talking about when we go back to land are new methods of learning. There's different ways you have to learn. You can you cannot study a tree, you know, with the physiology of a tree. You could, you know, you could weigh a tree and see how much it weighs, what the bark texture feels like, how much water it absorbs, how many rings it has. That's the physiology. But how do you talk to a tree? How do you sense how you develop your senses so that you understand what the forest is saying. These are methods, these are ways of knowing knowledge that, you know, our people had. And this is what we are trying to bring out as being relevant in terms of how we do help, how we see, how we see the land. In our community, we are studying that, we're looking back at the history, we're going back, we're Back to the Ice Age already. During the Ice Age, we have narratives that tell us what happened here in our community during the Ice Age. Can you imagine that? That's 11,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago. How we see going back into mythical times. This is how rich our people are. Communicating. How do you, how do you communicate with... with um, the, the sentient beings that surround us here, and especially out in the country, like you know, out here. How do you live? How to live? Yeah. So that's what they said. Go back to the land. And Maureen Lux wrote a, a, a book called Medicine and Books. And that quote is attributed to Long Lodge, but uh, Long Lodge said, yeah, don't give us your medicine. Give us medicine that rocks, meaning the buffalo, meaning the living beings of the land. You know, we could say, well, give me medicine that rocks. Give me a rabbit or give me a duck. You know, um, this is and how, how we treat these sentient beings is just as important. We have songs for these, you know, moose hunting songs or you know, there are different ways that our people have always interacted with nature so that there's an ethical interaction that's happening so that, you know, um, you know, our people have been lifting pipes to the, to the universe, to the Mother Earth, to the east, to the sun, the thunderbirds, the wind, and everything like the, the buffaloes, the, you know, the fire, the rocks. And they, 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 they tell us that, you know, We've been having associations with all these beings for thousands of years, you know. Do you think they're going to let you down at a time when you really need them? 
so it's just words of encouragement and, and they, 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 they show us how to understand this natural world. So it is about our coexistence with sentient beings that, that you know, if we, if, we, if we work on that, that we know that, uh, they, you know, they are protectors. They, 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 they are, they love us. They are interested in our, in our uh, survival. They are interested in our being. They're very interested in our being. Uh, you know, the lake is interested in our being. The sky, the thunderbirds, they're interested in our being and they love us. And so these are teachings, you know, and how does it, you know, how does it all play out in our life? That, that's the important thing that we really try to get understanding about. So spirituality really is about how we approach the future. You know, if you have people running around with their, like, chickens with their heads chopped off, doomsday sayers, doomsayers, you know, well, they probably have not very much spirituality because they see doom in the future. But if we see people that are really positive and say, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll go through this, you know, next, you know, the next month is going to be better. You know, we're going to, we are going to survive and we're just going to enjoy life much more. Uh, we, we see our children growing up to be very strong Cree, Cree people, very strong in their land-based knowledge, very strong in their spirituality. You know, not to cut down our people. So spirituality really is about seeing a future that, that is real, positive, and that's, that's the intent, I think, of all our sentient friends to help us achieve that positive future. So some criteria that's really important, and I'll put them on here, when we talk about spirituality, you know, uh, for people who pray to the universe, to the creator, we'll say, uh, pray to the, the spiritual world, and what they see is an aliveness. That's what our old people have told us. There's an aliveness there. It's alive. And so these become criteria of anything that's spiritual. And, and they told us everything is spiritual. Not, you know, they didn't put little piles of this and say, this is spiritual. And another little pile and said, this is not spiritual. They said, everything is spiritual. So all around us is this idea, of, uh, this these criteria, it's all around us and everything we see around us, an aliveness, a consciousness, awareness, intelligence, and a responsiveness. So we really have to watch what we say, what we think, because you know that 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 that, that spiritual aliveness out there can animate, it can move, it can influence the way things are going to happen. And this is a sort of a, a very surface explanation, but this is what our old people, our spiritualists talk about when they start talking about how important the land is, you know, because of this responsiveness. Our old people have told us, you know, you know, when we have tornadoes here and there, well, or floods here and there, or heat waves and so forth, even even these uh, viruses. So they, they tell us, well, it's because people have lost their capacity, their ability to communicate with the natural world. They're not telling nature what they want. They might tell a doctor what they want, but they, they forgot about maybe it's the bear you need to tell that to, or the lake. So it's a communication, and how exactly do you communicate with the, with the natural world? See, these are study areas that uh, somebody has to do, otherwise humanity is going to forget about all of these capacities that humans can do. So if we understand, if we think about our energy, our spirituality as energies, we have a better capacity to work 
those energies. You, you can, with a snap of a finger, change your thoughts, for example, from a negative thought to a positive thought. Oh, I'm going to die to one, oh, I'm going to live, you know, another 50 years or so. That You know, it's a matter of, of choice. But we can work with that kind of energy. And that, that's really what our spirituality is all about, is how we approach the future. Uh, I don't think I have time. Um, can somebody come on and tell me how much more time I have? Maybe uh, Alex or Michael? You've got about uh, 15 or 20 minutes, actually. Okay. Well, I'll go through this then. Uh, I just want to give it snippets snippets of uh, these ideas because I know there's going to be a question and answer. So maybe along the way, you'll get a thought about having a question in a particular area. So <clears throat> we come from a, a Cree people, Cree language. And that language is very descriptive, uh, descriptive of uh, our world, our universe, our worldview. It's a very descriptive language. It tells, that language tells us what what is. So if we want to know something, whether whether it's an indigenous thought or not, you know, in Canada, we've been uh, through the residential school area, for example, we've been immersed in this uh, mainstream uh, English oriented education, you know, that uh, we were, you know, we were taught as if they're going to develop us into good little Europeans so that we will forget who we are, forget our land, forget our language, forget everything like that. And so the residential school because of that, you know, so we become enmeshed with the Canadian world, I mean, uh, the Canadian society now that uh, we have a hard time figuring out that whether this is an indigenous idea or not, you know, whether in fact we are now European, you know, in our mind and behavior that all everything that we do is European, uh, following European style and and pattern, you know. But what is what is Cree? What is Cree? What you know that that's again that's another area we explore. So just to give you an example of how that one works, you know, we have a question like, what is health? Okay, now. You look into our language, uh, you look into our dictionary, very easily 20 words will pop up and say this word for, you know, there are 20 words that talk about health, at least. There are more than that, and because there's so many ways of approaching this. But Miyamatsu is an example, and I'll just use that one just, just, to, just to give an example here. Miyamatsu, that, that's the Cree word for health. Yeah, yeah, I'm healthy. Now, we take the root word. The first root is myo, myo, myo. M-I-Y-O, myo. Uh, that one, what, it, what that one teaches or what it states is something positive, something good, something nice. Like if you look outside, it's me. It's a beautiful day. Good day. Uh, if I were going to look at all your faces, I would say, You look beautiful. You know, it's good. So it's a positive word. That, that's the first root there. The second root here is M A C I, Machi. And where you sit right now, you can get up and just uh, and just dance like crazy for a couple of seconds. Just go ahead, go ahead, dance like crazy where you where you are now, wherever you are, dance like crazy for a couple of seconds, and then sit down again. And what you just did was machi, machi. What that root word is saying is movement. It's the movement. It's our movement. Okay? That's machi. So, so far, good, positive movement. That's two ideas that come out right away. And then the other one whole is it, it, it's the way to be. It, that's, uh, that's the way to be. This, um, I don't know how 
while so I can say it. it it's uh, the state of being. It, it's how you are, and that's how you're supposed to be. Okay, that, that kind of thing. And then the last one is uh, the suffix uh, that just tells us that it, there is a system for this in the Cree world. That there is a system. When is a system? So there's a whole system of how to be in good, positive movement, how to be in a state of good, positive movement. There's a whole system. It doesn't tell us, you know, to well, go for a walk one kilometer a day or something. It, it doesn't give us instruction like that. Uh, but we know that there is a whole system, and that's because there's so many possibilities. I think. So what is health? It's to be... Uh, it's a system of uh, being in a state of good positive movement. There, that's the definition of health. But that is superficial. That is still superficial. We want to go a little bit deeper with this idea of movement, machi. Okay? Take that one again, take the root words. M-A talks about re repetition. Something repeating. M-A. Imamatut. Ima, ma, ma, tut, or, you know, it, 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 use it in, in what do you want to state something is uh, repeated, re repetition, uh, it's being repeated. Uh, the other part is chi, and, and you see what I have to do with all these words is, uh, oh, example with chi, I have to look for other words that contain chi, like chi sta. To prick yourself with a needle, that's chista. Okay, chi chi cha, chi chi pa pe means to have those little uh, flickering under your eyelids, you know, when it flickers. And people will say, Well, you're going to see somebody or something. Like that. So, chi, I have to bring in these other words and, and from there start ex uh, dis deciphering with what. What idea is contained in that particular root word as used in that word context? Okay, so chi was a little bit hard to uh, figure out, but I finally got it. It taught what what it talks about is a particle. Chi is a particle. Can you believe it? A particle. Um, let me give you an example of how I would derive that idea. My mother used to tell me, before you go hunting, talk to your grandfather and ask him for chi sawan. Chi sawan is a moose nose. That's our feast food. We take the moose nose, clean it up, and uh, singe the hair off, and it's, when it's ready for soup, then you cut it into all these little pieces little squares that are the size of the tip of your small finger, you know? And each one of these is a chi, a particle, a part, a part. It's a particle. It's a chi. Chi is particle. Sawan is to cut, cut into particles. That, that That's where that idea comes from. So chi is a particle. So repeating particle. Can you imagine that? Ma Chi is talking about repeating particles. Now, we're getting into pretty deep, heavy quantum physics when you start talking like that, when you start talking about repeating particles. But this word is an ancient word, and I call it um, the creator's philosophy because it's a creator that gave us the language and and embedded all these concepts within the language. So repeating particle, we are made of repeating particles. Now you can go up there and study all you want about that idea. You, you will not, it, you know, you, you cannot refute that idea that we are repeating particles. So that's what the language teaches us about who we are. Now, if we know we are repeating particles, then we can start thinking about how can we manipulate these particles? How can we talk to these particles? How can we use these particles to our advantage? You know, how do we do that? And that's the healer's work. The healers, 
that's the work that they did. Any healer will tell you that the way they heal is simply a matter of shifting energies around, shifting the particles around in the body so that health happens. See, this is knowledge that comes from the past, from our own people. And this is what we are interested in. So, Namokamatun is another idea. Namokamatun talks about unity and cohesion. Now, I, tell, I said our community is a collective. So, we have to look after the collective. The collective has to work together. The teamwork that happens uh, not only with the pandemic committee, but naturally with the state of different, different departments, you know, the chief and council in different departments, uh, maybe, um, uh, you know, they, 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 they'll form teamwork in different ways. Um, all this to create some sort of a group genius that there is genius in groups, uh, there is genius in the collective mind, that there is, it's better to have more heads, uh, it's smarter to have more heads, you know, or more heads are smarter than one head, that, that kind of thing. Um, and then, especially if we have unity of purpose to, to achieve higher goals or something bigger to strive for, you know, what are those goals? What are those, what is it that we're trying to become? You know, those, those have to be a part of our visioning exercises. So this uh, and again, it, it's not something that uh, maybe one elder laying on his pillow kind of dreamed up and said, well, yeah, from now on, we're going to be talking about it. Mamokamato in and unity and purpose and all that, you know, it, it, it comes from the language, it comes from the teachings. And our philosophers, our spiritualists understand this, you know, and in the universe, in fact, it becomes a universe. This is a universal language, how to, to do unity and purpose out in the universe. You look at the galaxy, this galaxy would fall apart if it did not have, if it did not have intent. It knows how to work together to be a galaxy. It's out there. It's in You look outside your window someday. In the fall, you would see this quite often. How do these birds work as one? How do they work as one? How come they don't collide? Look, look at them. They can make great formations because they work as one. This is Mamo Kamatu, and that's the Cree word for working in unity, cohesion, working as one. This is the kind of work we try to do in a community. This is our heritage. This is what your people talked about. How do we do that? How do the birds do this magic that you see? Is this a ceremony that they have? What is it? Our elders have told us you can learn a lot from nature. Study it. Well, you study this and you mind-boggling how Unity, cohesion can work. And they said, try to do that. Now, how do we do that? That's the question, million dollar question. How do we do that? So therefore, we have our community work cut out for us. And it even goes into the particle stage. I just talked about particles, how that cohesion can happen at the particle stage. And remember, I talked about everything is spiritual. It has an aliveness, awareness, responsiveness. So within our bodies are particles that are alive, that are aware, that are responsive, that are intelligent. You can even have a chat with your finger, your big toe, the particles inside of you. These are teachings, and you know, with the help of quantum physics, that it, we we can 
make sense of, of a lot of the teachings by using, you know, quantum physics, for example, the study of light, the study of particles. And so what you see there is our Mayo Clinic. There's a, there's a place to study these particles. You know, our old people have told us, yeah, it's all about ethics, how you treat nature, how you treat the animals, how you treat the universe, how you treat the galaxies, how you treat your particles. And so these have become study areas. And when elders go in here and you tell them, yeah, I have a sore kidney today. What do they do? They bring out the, the rattle or the drum and they start singing. And they start talking to, the, to those particles of the kidney. Shifting energies you know, within the body. They sing the songs for those particles. They know the names of those particles. They know how to talk to them in a beautiful way. Not a war language like we are now. In, well, I see you every time I open the TV. It's a war language. We are fighting this virus. We are at war. This is not the language to use. We, the ethics requires us to talk to all of nature, but we have to know the language. We have to know how to communicate. We have to know the names. We have to know the songs. We have to know the language and all that. And, and this is exactly what traditional health is all about, how we study that. We need help to study that, you know. We cannot give up on that because there's some there's some really fine, beautiful treasures that I personally see in all of that. But the Mayo Clinic, our Mayo Clinic, may not be this uh, magnificent, magnificent superstructure. You know that took billions of dollars to prepare, and knowledge accumulated to over over many countries and many by many people. Ours is a humble little structure, the power of small things. It's the mind, it's the people project, it's, it's, it's the knowledge that is really important here in this Mayo Clinic. So the sweat lodge, uh, alive, intelligent, aware, responsive. I just told you that these are criteria. Physiology. It's about physiology. You want to you wanna, you wanna repair your back? You want mental therapy? Come in a sweat lodge. Do you want spiritual repair? Come on in. You want a, you want a confessional? Is guilt weighing you down? You need to tell somebody about something? Come and listen to Hi-Fi Stereo. Listen to the songs, the songs of the creation, the universe, the beautiful songs to the sun, to the wind, to the mountains, to the bear, to the stone. Hi-Fi Stereo. Close your eyes. Listen. It's also a place of learning. In Sturgeon Lake, we are embarking on this uh, a knowledge center, a traditional knowledge center where we... We do the midway free. We do the traditional health. We do the language. We do the, all these other things um, in memory where, where we we do giftedness training, you know. But nobody is out there willing to make that commitment. All the funds go to, to these monolithic institutions. More money to universities and medical schools and Western institutions. But nobody supports our ideas. But we have to continue. It's a synchrotron. It's a study of particles. There's one not far from here. Two hours from here, there's a synchrotron. 
I saw, I didn't see the big one, but I was pretty close to that big one at the Switzerland France border. Large hand glider. And we could talk hours about that kind of work that they're doing there. But the one thing that the, if we told our elders that they're going to try to discover the God particle over there, they would say, we've been doing that for thousands of years. Do they know the, do they know the names of those particles? Do they know the songs for those particles? Do they know the language for those particles? That's how far they have to go yet. But we've been doing that for a long time. So my friend, um, to be continued. It's a long story. It'll be continued. Okay, Michael, we'll, we'll wow. end there. That was incredible. Thank you so much, uh, Willie. That's not easy to do at all to present something like this over a webinar, and you were incredibly engaging. So I actually danced during what for Machi <laughs> when you asked us to dance. I did. So thanks sure. very much. And now I'll um, I'll pass it along to Mike. Great. So I'm just going to message everyone. Please send your questions and comments to me uh, privately so that I can bring them into the larger group. Um, so I see someone's raised their hand. If you can add the, just put the chat to, um, into the chat, the question in the chat room, that'd be great. And we're just waiting for a second to see if any of the questions. So I'll start with the first one and then we'll start to pepper them in. Um, one question is, how do we think about the health of specific organs within frameworks, these frameworks of health, like the, like the brain, for example, is an organ? How do we consider the health of the brain, for example? Of, of individual organs within that system of health you're talking about? Well, it's uh, it, the, the sentient beings that are out there are alive. And I just finished talking about particles being alive within the body. So um, if you want to know a little bit more about that, those ideas, uh, read uh, uh, Stephen Boner's book, uh, Plant Intelligence. Stephen, uh, S-T-E-P-H-A-N, B-U-H-N-E-R, Stephen Booner plant intelligence, the imaginal realm. And it talks about uh, how um, our, our, our organs, for example, are, are their own ecosystems. They, they, they are in fact their own, their own system. And, and, and they have a sense, a sensory process that they themselves know how to be a heart, for example. A heart knows how to be a heart. We don't have to make effort to um, to make a heart into a heart, you know, it knows how to be a heart, but we can, we can, we can certainly help it along, and we can benefit from that. It it, it has its own systems, and, and same with other organs. So um, we we are, I think, um, as Stephen Bonner put it, a swarm of uh, we are made of swarms of swarms, you know, like. Like the heart has its swarm of sensory inputs, outputs, and processes, and everything like that. And those in organs, uh, we can also match to the natural world. And that's, that's where this idea of medicine comes from. Uh, that we can match uh, my heart organ to the natural world. I can, you know, in the natural world, I can see which plant is meant for the heart. And so this pairing uh, between the in and the out, you know, it is really uh, makes up a lot of what traditional medicine is all about. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of questions are, are along this theme of what are your thoughts on the best way to incorporate the principles of spiritual health that you've been talking about into current approaches to public health? 
And another question asks, how do we how do we do that in the in the sense of being connected during our current isolation periods? Well, um, the the magic thing about um, uh, you know spiritual health and, and um, it is that uh, no matter where you go, there it is. You cannot shelve your your spirituality one day and leave it in there in your dresser and as you go about your day it it's inseparable wherever you are there it is and and, and it is very influential because as i said there is so much happening inside our our being and spirituality is one of them that is uh, that determines really what kind of a day we're going to have how we're going to uh, be competent we want to be competent in, in the things that we do um, you know, uh, competence depends a lot on spirituality. What kind of a spirituality you have? It, it it's about your values. You know, what is it that you value? Do you value uh, uh, the economic system like they do in the states, or or do you value the health of your your child that you're holding right now, or your grandchild? Um, it, it's what we value. It and that 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 really creates our essence. It's it's our emotional world, you know. These are all unseen things, and they form a part of our spirituality, our emotional world. Even our mental world can be a part of that. It's it. So all these things put together, you know, the mental world. What kind of a future do we see? The these um, um, we can work on these and and develop our own spirituality in there. And again, we have in our in our Cree systems uh, ways that we do development in all these areas, and that's what I mean about our richness of our culture, Cree culture, for example. Uh, 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 it's it's a, it's like a box of treasures, you know. Uh, we haven't really put our 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 hands into those treasures yet to uncover what they are, because uh, there's been so many. So much memory eraser happening in our history that we we think it doesn't exist. But you know, the more I look deeper into those treasures, the more I see, and you know, the more that uh, um, I feel that I wish I can give everybody that sense of richness that we have in our in our traditions and our understandings. And so, how do we put it out into the population health? You know, it. it it's um, Mamo Kamato and talks about the whole collective, and and I know I get asked a lot, you know. Well, you know, this is an indigenous idea. Is it okay for me as a non-indigenous person to be subscribing to these ideas, or can I use them, or is that appropriation? You know, those kind of questions. And I say, well, you know, we. You're a human being, aren't you? I'm a human being. My grandfather was a human being. My great, great, great ancestors were human beings. And what they were studying was how to be human being. What does it take to be a good human being? That was their study area. And I think, uh, you know, that whatever we do in the Cree, in our Cree humanity, and that's a scientific method. Whatever we do in our pre-humanity, if it works for us, it should work for any other people in the world. That's the replication that they talk about in science, the rigor, the rigorous study, you know, you should be able to replicate. And that's exactly the same with this spiritual knowledge and spiritual, spiritual practice and human practice. You should be able to replicate. If it works for us, other people should be able to replicate it as well and that's that's why i say we are not asking for pity because of all the things that happened to us you know to residential schools and all that uh, what we're saying is we have something to offer to humanity and it's very rich and maybe things like this crisis just remind us that you know maybe we should Open the open that ethical space where we can have real dialogues about about humanity 
And that's what that ethical space is all about. How do we talk to each other as human beings, you know, not as a prescribed person, say, coming from the university. You know, you speak the university language or, or from medical school, you, talk, you, you just speak the doctor language or from Indian affairs. You know, when they come to our community, they flop down their big book on the desk and they say, these are our guidelines, these are our regulations, and these are our budget lines. We have to keep the discussion to within this. You know, that's a prescriptive talk, and you, that's not a human being talking. That's an institution talking. So we have to somehow break free from these institutional prescriptions that tell us this is the line you have to say. This is the line you have to talk. Because for us, all those institutions have been peppered with all kinds of colonial thought. And nobody has come to me and said, yeah, we got rid of all the colonialism in education or in, in policy or in, in, in any institutions they have in the state. So it's, there's still a lot of that, those lingering, you know, colonial thought patterns that have been embedded in st institutions. So somehow we need to talk about those. And that's what I talk about when I talk about reconciliation. So it's 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 a long process, as you can see. So I'm just gonna. There's several themes coming out here. Um, in public health, we often wrestle with how do we pay attention to the population, to the public, to the collective, because we have Western systems that focus so much on the individual. And, and your pre ways of knowing and of approaching health have been articulating the ways in which the individual is part of the collective. And I think part of what people are looking for is a way of understanding how we can integrate the ways of knowing that you're describing so that we can better balance and engage with the collective in, in public health. Could you give us any guidance on that? Um, I, I would say look for the article, The Ethical Space. You can Google my name and um, perhaps somewhere along the way you'll, you'll find the link that'll take you right to the document itself. And what that talks about, it really is uh, um, that dialogue is really important, first of all. That it, it you know, the days of the anthropological research are, uh, you know, parachuting into our community, asking a question, getting all the information and disappearing and then using that knowledge to fatten up this other institution, you know, those days are over, in my mind anyway, um, in our community anyway. But uh, there has to be a dialogue and there has to be mutual benefit, you know. Like if in Vancouver you have the School of Population and Public Health at UBC, and I'm not sure what kind of a territory you'll cover, but we'll just imagine all of BC and then uh, you know, um, uh, if, if you want this kind of knowledge, uh, well, who has that kind of knowledge that you would be seeking? Now, how, how, then how do you dialogue? How, how, do, you, how do you come to uh, a space where, you know, you know that, uh, for example, you, Michael, uh, as a human being, you, you know, you, you know, as a human being, you come to the table as a human being to talk about uh, your interest in this whole idea. And I would come to the table as Willie and, and, you know, I have children, I have grandchildren, I have a wife and I have a dog, probably mice in a cellar or somewhere, I don't know. You know, I have my world of, of humanity and so do you. You know, first of all, we have to understand each other at that level, then start dreaming a little bit about what is possible, you know, the idea that we're talking about. What is possible? We have to talk in a language of possibility and also mutuality that, you know, well, this is how you're going to benefit, but how am I going to benefit? You know, uh, the school of po population and public health can take all the ideas and really give themselves capacity and probably write a, a proposal, a funding proposal to to fund this uh, great idea that you got from our discussion, and, and then and then create curriculum and invite all these students to come to your great school to study this great idea. You know, 
that is your capacity building in the meantime. What do we have in the community? What did you leave us in the community that would help us to c continue developing these uh, knowledges that are ancestral, that are a lot of them ancient, a lot of them, you know, just kind of sitting there, nobody really uh, working on them at all. So it, it has to be a dialogue that we have to dream. We have to dream first. You can't, you can't, you can't, you know, be the institution and implement this great idea that that is outside our scope. You know, it's it's it cannot exist within your institution because it's such a big idea that it doesn't fit in your prescribed spaces. So I don't know dialogue. Coming to some of the points that other questions are raising, that in some ways under COVID-19, when we think of the collective, it's disconnecting that is the collective action. It's a kind of an ironic situation that we're supposed to socially distance. But, and yet we need to stay connected. Our mental health, our cultural and spiritual well-being is, is also about how we connect. Um, and I think you started describing actually, and then we saw in, in the videos, how it is that your community has been able to connect in times of needing to socially distance. Can you can you help us understand more about that? It, it, it probably relates to the higher purpose. We'll, we'll say uh, somewhere in one of the slides, I think I talked about a higher purpose, you know, to strive for something bigger. And it could be, it, it, it might fit in there. I think we can, we can, make a reasonable argument that it could fit in there, uh, that um, um, we strive for bigger things. You know, maybe this is a, a reflective moment, you know. Um, it, it's not all gloom and despair, but uh, to have a really reflective moment, you know, we enjoy the time with uh, our family. Uh, what opportunity is there? I'm not sure how many people are take advantage of that to really actually, you know, shift into out of their uh, out of their boxes and come out of out of the box ideas in order to do something um, not only to build up the family love or the family in, in some way or to come out of uh, the box and think of think in a new way how to do things in a new way we we could take that opportunity, but it's a a strive for it's a reflective moment. Perhaps we can think about, and we haven't thought about it. For example, I mentioned in the beginning climate change. You know, why climate change is happening, and how climate change might be influencing what is happening right now. Um, I haven't heard anything of, of that kind of a discussion at all. Um, but you know. Um, the, the, those same ideas, for example, if you if you have a pandemic, you know, um, remember that virus. I, I tell we tell people over here, don't use fighting words against this virus. And again, that's one of our teachings that um, don't use fighting words against this virus. Don't pretend that you're a big, massive army with all capacity to be able to fight this virus and defeat it. You know. Because what it can do is really turn turn on you in a way that you, you'll say, ouch, it could be your family, it could be yourself individually. Um, but it also can can be in a form of a second wave. Okay, you didn't have enough that time. Well, I'll come back again and see how you say, ouch, make people whistle, you know. Uh, so how do, you, how, do, how do we... How, how do we form a sort of a consciousness of a critical mass, so to speak, of positivity that uh, that you know can have influence in in how uh, what the outcome might be in in well any situation, I guess, but in this particular instance, for example, how do we create a critical mass? Of people that are positive and laughing and joking and you know uh, YouTubing all kinds of uh, beautiful stuff uh, uh, and how do we uh, how do we create a consciousness that is living and that can change the course 
for us, you know. So this kind of reflection might be might help us, you know, start to develop these these capacities as human beings, how we work collectively, how we work with nature, how we send our thoughts out to the universe, how these influence uh, the way things will happen. And that's what our old people have been talking about. Talk to nature, they, they told us. Talk to yeah. mother. Another one of the questions is, uh, and note, we note that we see great disparities in the way the current situation affects different people in different communities. It shows the underlying disparities and injustices in stark contrast, much more so than, than they have been before COVID-19. Um, is this an opportunity for us to take a positive movement, a, an attitude of health and well-being towards those to think of COVID as an opportunity to bring positive change? That's what I just finished answering, yeah. yeah I think this was a question yeah. that you're tracking. I think people are tracking this very well, actually. Um, some of the questions are coming to, to understanding how to weave traditional, how to understand and learn traditional knowledge. So how can participation in a sweat lodge ceremony be shared with settler peoples who have not had much experience? Or is that appropriate? Well, there are different, different, you know, we're not saying that the sweat lodge is the only valid, viable way in the whole world. And we're not saying that at all. It, you know, that what we're saying is this is one of our tools. You know, you, you, you are welcome. But, you know, every other human community, other peoples have their own ways that they were given that they can address the their environment, their their, their universe, you know, their and and then this is what I often mention is that, you know, um, we have been marginalized in this country uh, as indigenous people. And then the discourse comes around that says, uh, well, you should be pitied, you know, you really need healing. You know, if I told you, Michael, Michael, you need healing. Do you know that, Michael? You need healing. If I said that to you, you know, that that does not make you feel good. You're less than optimum. You're, you're, you, you know, there's something wrong with you if, you if people tell you that. And yet that's the kind of discourse we have in this country, saying uh, Aboriginal people, they really need healing. Look at all the things that happened to them. But we didn't do anything. It's the perpetrator, you know, the, the one, the colonial mind, the one that wanted to wipe out our indigeneity, though, and that's the one with that needs healing. That's the mind that needs healing. So um, we we have um, we we have we, we have, and I and I tell people, can you do you know where you come from, who you are? Do you know your ancestors? What where did they come from? What is your knowledge? What do you know? What is your human gift? Can you speak your language? If you can't do any of those things, you are in no better position than I am, whose so memory has been erased. Or they tried to erase our memory. Your memory has also been erased. We're in the same boat here. You know, but we're not holding on to the coattails of uh, privilege and power. So if you, you know, people should really go back to their sources, to go back to their own giftedness, to go back to the, the values that they have, if they love their families and their children and, you know, you know to go hug a tree <laughs> if you want. Um, but everybody should really start reflecting on what those kind of sources are. What are their sources? They don't have to go around searching all over the world to find one that fits them. Look deep inside you. What what does it say in there? So I think some of the, the um, questions are asking how we incorporate and better understand the ways of knowing that aren't familiar to, to our traditions or your traditions, which you're reading 
discovering. You're, you're rediscovering and teaching them. One of the questions is, how are you teaching young people about the medicinal plants? But I think an extension of that is, is it appropriate for us to learn about medicinal plants? You've already suggested we should dig into our own backgrounds, but, but what's the role of learning about medicinal plants for your children and for us? In our community, and then we've um, gone to and it, also different communities, we have uh, uh, medicine camps, we have a pharmacy, we have, uh, you know, the context is pretty well here already. And it, it's a matter of, um, I, I think, in, it, as we shoot into the future, uh, making it more, making it normal, that it's normal to have a traditional medicine pharmacy in a community right now it's not normal in any community you go it's in our community it's normal it's normal that traditional the the healing law is the traditional medicine and it, it, it's becoming normalized you know the children are seeing it the community is seeing it that's how it has to be now the important thing and i i, think, I don't know maybe i'll just say it again the important thing right now is that this knowledge has to grow. You know, that there are people out there who are tr trying to recover this knowledge. It's like, um, I forgot the name of the author, but uh, one author was saying, you know, our knowledge is like a little fire. We don't want people, come, too many people hoarding around a the fire. They might blow it out or something. But it's our responsibility to look after the fire and keep adding minuscule shavings of wood and keep, keep the fire, build it up you know, higher and brighter. And, um, and in this way, once the, the flame gets really big, then we can share with the rest of the world our fire. You know? So those are the, the kind of ideas. In, uh, we, we need we need we need help you know we need we need assistance we need collaboration we need we need dialogues we, we need to do this together otherwise we um, you know the, we we don't um, we continue on our prescriptions that has been created by a colonial mind I think that's a wonderful place to finish and to bring Peter back in to thank you and wrap up our session. Thank you so much. And we're just, there he is. You're on mute right now, Peter. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Well, uh, Willie, thank you so much. That was just an incredibly inspiring and also uh, wonderful transformation from what has been preoccupying so many of us on a day-to-day -day basis uh, these last weeks, whether it's being with ourselves uh, and trying to connect with others, uh, working, feeling we should be working, also wanting to have that opportunity to reflect on these bigger questions and who we are and how trying to be connected in a time when it's even harder to be connected. So many important things you brought out for us. So I really want to thank you very much for that. Um, uh, there clearly is a lot that we can learn from and experience with this current situation that we're in. And let us all try to take advantage of all those positive learning opportunities that this brings to us uh, about ourselves, about our collective, our community, about our world, our universe, and our compatriots in, uh, in, our, in our nation. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone uh, who made this possible, Alex, uh, uh, Simona, Stefan, um, John, thank you, uh, 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 and sorry, Michael, thank you so much for your great uh, moderating and it's so hard to to um, manage all these questions uh, remotely. Uh, I think you did a great job, and uh, uh, David Silver and the Center for Applied Ethics for making this all possible. And last again, and not least at all, Willie, you again for stepping up to the plate here, 
with us remotely, uh, we hope we will have a chance to welcome you to Vancouver in person one day. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we really look forward to that. So with that, let me bring this to a close. Thank you everybody for attending. We had great participation. Voices in Health is going to continue even in our remote, uh, even in our remote setting. We are hoping to continue to have events in May, in May and in June.